Okay, well, this is Chris McNeil. This is Ministry on the Move, and I'm going to stop announcing the episodes on this side of the equation, and I'll give it to you at the front side um, because I've gotten really bad at, at keeping up with which episode this is. But uh, we are at the Lighthouse Church in Mangum, Mangum Oklahoma, and with the pastor, uh, Sean Laughlin. 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 You're Laughlin. right. I had Laughlin. said it right the first time. Laugh and then Lynn. All right. Laugh Laughlin. Lynn. Laughlin. Which is terrible because we've been to this church. I bet this is our seventh time. Every bit of it. Yeah, <laughs> it just feels like family now. I know. Yeah. Except the fact that I can't get your last name right. Yeah. Well, that just uh, happens. Yeah. I mean, you guys uh, have been so kind to the McNeils. You had us here during COVID. You've had us here before COVID. You had us here after COVID. You guys brought, I don't remember how many people were on it, but you, you brought a bus to come see us at the Ark Encounter out in Kentucky. Yes, we did. We went all the way to Kentucky, had a whole bus load. We chartered a bus and got stuck in somebody's front <laughs> front lawn in the middle of nowhere and on a dead-end road in Kentucky. Was scared to death, but we made it in made time it. to listen. Yeah, that was a, that was a fun, exciting it was an exciting trip, wasn't it? It was very exciting, to say the least. Yep. So so you guys um, and your church have been such a blessing to the McNeils, and um, it's, it's so good to be back. And we have, we have looked forward to this day um, for a few months now, truthfully. Um, so, Sean, but so much of the story, um, when we've gotten together, I'm, has not been about you. I, I'm, I remember... We've, you know, we've gone out and played golf. We went and played putt-putt. Um, you guys have always treated us really well and had a lot of fun, but I've never heard your story. So I'm, I'm interested to know. Now, before I get started, I do know part of it. You are bivocational, and you are also a state trooper for the state of Oklahoma. Yes, I am. Yeah. And uh, so that's kind of cool. uh, kind of a cool angle, one that I'm really quite interested to, to know more about. But I want to start at the beginning. How did how did you wind up being a pastor? How did how was the call? I was raised uh, United oh. Pentecostal Church. Uh, was have always been raised in church. I uh, I remember growing up, and my uh, falling asleep under the pew, and yeah. and uh, my parents actually forgetting that I was there. The doors <laughs> locked, and me wake up, and <laughs> and uh, it was just dark. It, it was very dark, and wondering what in the world happened. But uh, I've always loved the Lord, and uh, I was uh, prophesied over at a very young mm-hmm. age on numerous occasions that, uh, that, that God had called me to preach. And I ran f- from it, ran from it. Law enforcement's what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. That was, uh, but when you get a calling on your life, uh, at some point, uh, you're going to have to give into it because because God's not going to, he's going to keep knocking and keep knocking. And uh, you're never going to be happy until you do what God's called you to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started pastoring several years ago. uh, First at uh, Church of New Beginnings uh, here in Mangum. And uh, we kind of outgrew that. And over the years, uh, uh, we've moved here to the uh, Lighthouse Church. And God has truly blessed us. This, we've got a great community, and our, we've got the best church family in the world. And uh, just country folks, and they love God. Mm-hmm. They just truly love God. It is. I am so glad that I answered God's calling. How, how old were you when you finally said, okay? Uh, I would have been... I've been in the ministry... Uh, about 15 years now as far as uh, pastoring. So I was in my uh, 30s mm-hmm. when I started, uh, when I finally said, hey, I've, I've got to do what God has called me to do. What are you, what, 53? I am 52 now. 52? Yes. So so 15 years ago. Um, and, and then, so you, you started at New Beginnings, Yes, and then there was it wasn't a it wasn't a it wasn't a split, but there was I, I remember this from the first time that we were here. <clears throat> the two church two churches came together, did they not? Yes, they did. We uh, this was uh, 
Grace Christian Fellowship, where we are now, mm -hmm. and then there was the uh, Church of New Beginnings, and uh, we we actually went together. I had a vision that that it would be great. Neither church had a pastor at that time, mm. and uh, I I just prayed about it and put it in God's hands. And a lot of folks said that don't happen because <laughs> you hear church splits all the time. Right. But uh, I'm telling you, God was all over it, mm -hmm. and we got together, and we put our boards together from each church. Without God, it wouldn't be possible, mm -hmm. but it has been the best thing that has ever happened in, uh, in my life, I know, and it, is, it, is, it has been beneficial in the kingdom of God. I believe that, I, and I'm fascinated to know uh, <clears throat> Uh, both churches were of the same denomination? We were non-denominational. Okay. Uh, I was raised United Pentecostal, mm -hmm. so we lean, lean Pentecostal. Sure. And uh, uh, some people call us Baptocostal, but... Uh, I've been accused of that a time or two myself. Yes, but we, we love God. Uh -huh. And so how was it, was it difficult to, to take two churches and, and merge them into one, or was it, was it pretty easy and straightforward? You know, it was uh, it was a lot easier than what we anticipated, mm -hmm. and uh, you hear horror stories and how tough it'll be. Not only was we moving from a whole nother building, uh, one of the churches, we were actually moving them to a whole to whole separate building across town. Right, and so we've uh, never done it that way. They said, and exactly, yeah. But I'm telling you, we prayed about it. We fasted about it, and uh, there was there was a little bit rocky roads here and there, but overall, I'm telling you, it, it has been a tremendous, tremendous thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm unfamiliar with um, Presby uh, Pentecostal um, polity. Were there were there were there two boards, or there, it was a. It, Elder led, deacon led. Um, you said no pastor in either either church at the time. At the time, uh, I had pastored the church New Beginnings, and I, I had took a short break. Mm. Uh, there had been a series of things happen. Mm. Uh, we lost some people of our church family, and uh, I'm telling you, it just took a toll on me and my wife. Right, uh, and uh, so we took a short break from pastoring, but uh, the calling was still there. Right. We couldn't get away from it. The Church of New Beginnings had lost their pastor. Grace Christian was in a process. Their pastor was uh, going to be leave, leave, leaving also. Mm -hmm. So uh, we prayed about it, and, uh, man, it was just miraculous Yeah, the way everything fell in place. It was a God deal. Yeah, and how, how many years ago was that? That's been about three years now. Are you serious? Yes. Three or Three or four years, maybe four now. Was it not pre-COVID? Yes, it was pre-COVID. It was pre-COVID. I may have my my years mixed up here, Cause, cause but I was thinking time it was always Lighthouse, by. and we started here in 2019. I thought 2019. It, it was Lighthouse when y'all came here. Yeah, okay. And so that would have right. probably, if I'm not mistaken, 2018. So that would be okay. that six years. Six years now. Wow. Time has yeah. flown. <laughs> It has flown, <laughs> and it has been great. Wow. Well, and and I know uh, just just to underscore what you've been saying that the congregation is it, super sweet. the The fellowship here is is beautiful, and and it seems like a very vibrant and growing uh, church to the McNeils. Anyway, uh, and we only get to come once a year, but. Um, you know, that's an outsider's read on it, is, right. is that you're absolutely right. Um, so seminary, Bible college, Holy Spirit University, or? Holy Spirit <laughs> University. Uh -huh. I did get a, a, a bachelor's degree uh -huh. uh, in uh, law enforcement. Right. But uh, I got licensed with the United Pentecostal Church mm -hmm. initially. They have a series of things that you have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, books that you have to read and uh, that are required, and then you sit in front of a board, and that's initially where I got right. got licensed. And uh, but now I'm non-denominational and just uh, let God speak through me. 
what and and you know what i mean there's there's it, there's a beauty in that i mean jesus's disciples were tax collectors and fishermen and and thieves i mean right they we, we they ran the gambit there there's no there was no formal education the holy spirit obviously is in the business of empowering people uh day in and day out <clears throat> does it does the way that you came through, do you think that maybe that um, puts a heavier reliance uh, from your perspective? Do you rely more heavily on the Holy Spirit? Without a doubt. Yeah. Without a doubt. It, uh, And I have pastors that I have to lean to, us being mm-hmm. non-denominational. You know, I want my checks and balances. Sure. Right. And uh, from other pastors. So, so I do lean. Uh, I have uh, a couple pastors that I call my pastors. And uh, so I, I'm in contact with them quite a bit, and we pray together, mm-hmm. and we visit, and I get advice from them, and because uh, we all got to have that, right? Yeah, absolutely. We've got to have that. Talk to me about so Mangum has a special place in my heart, and for anybody that's listening, uh, I know you you know Sean, but um, my great grandmother. Uh, is buried in Blair, just five miles down the road. Yes, and my grandmother was born there, and and I was I was I think fifty three when we came here the first time, maybe younger fifty one, and I did not realize up until the week the McNeils showed up here that it is Mangum and Blair. I always thought it was Mangum Blair growing up. Uh, we I was up here when we buried my great grandmother in nineteen eighty one, um, and that's the only time I've been here. So so there's a little bit of Family history, right? Uh, for me, tell me, talk about the town, though. And uh, I know Starla, your wife, was talking about some. Uh, there's a it wasn't volleyball, softball game that was going on tonight. And I guess we're getting started into into um, school sports, right? Right, going into the fall. Talk about the the is the town growing or is it shrinking and contracting? Is it a? Is it a? It's a. It's a rural community. Very rural. And I'm assuming you've got farmers. It's a farming and ranching community. Mm-hmm. Primarily, we do have a brick plant here. Uh, we got a wonderful school system. Mm-hmm. Wonderful kids. I'm telling you, we hear all the time about our younger generation and and that we're in trouble. But I'm telling you right now, you get in Southwest Oklahoma, in rural Southwest Oklahoma, there's kids that love Jesus Christ yeah. right here. But Mangum is a great place. It truly is. And and so so is there much of a need to to have an outreach ministry? You know, some some places in big cities may may have a, a bus ministry to bring kids that you know are never going to go to church otherwise. Here, do do you is that a brother? It is. We there is a ministry. You know, we talk about a lot of times, and you hear about missions and this and that, and a lot of people think you got to go to the big cities or you got to go overseas or you got to go. There is a, anywhere you're at, I don't care how small your community is. There is a, if you have a heart for the lost and a heart for people and we've, uh, we just finished a vacation Bible school that we had, uh, had a hundred kids that attended our vacation Bible school. A lot of those didn't have a place to go to church, but we have found brother that if you'll reach, Everybody. And if you, in our community, you know, you have people that a lot of people look at over the years and they think, you know, there's no hope for that person. Mm -hmm. There's, we know them because we know everybody. Drugs has infested their life, alcohol, whatever it may be. But we have found here that if we will fall in love with, with the people and lost souls, no matter their social class, no matter who they are, that if we will fall in love with them and we'll go out and we'll get the people that I might say, I heard a preacher say it once like this, that nobody wants, Mm -hmm. God will bless you with people that everybody wants. And we have, uh, we've kind of had that mentality for a long time, brother, and just had a heart for people, no matter who they are. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have seen miracles take place in salvations and things of this nature that, just only you know that God's in it. Right, yeah. Without a doubt. So that sort of leads me to a, a line of questioning that I was really interested to pursue. It's got to be... So so. 
half of your life, you're spent being the lawman, as it were. Yes. And the other half, you're spent being the mercy man. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's a little complicated sometimes. <laughs> do, do you feel schizophrenic? <laughs> uh, I might be a little bipolar at times. Yeah. No. So, I mean, seriously, talk, talk, talk about walking that line because there, I get it. You, you, make a, you make a stop a, as an officer and you've got one hand on your gun, not knowing what's inside of the car, not knowing the person that you're fixing to confront, and this could be a life or death situation. Yes. And then you see in their eyes the fact that they need Jesus. Right. Right. Or by the same token, we could flip that around and say that you're the pastor and and you've got someone in your congregation that maybe you find out <laughs> they need to be arrested. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, it uh, it has happened both ways, uh. <laughs> without a doubt, uh, in our small area. Yeah. Of course, i got a lot of family, so I've had to arrest my own family. Oh, wow, well, that's uh, Our own church members. Oh, my. But I'm telling you, if you go about it with with love in your heart yeah, and you treat people like they are human, whether you have to write them a ticket or whether you have to take them to jail for drugs or whatever it may be, they see something different in somebody that loves God. Mm. And uh, we've got people in our church that that uh, they have came to church simply because because they have come in contact with me on the road. Because of the way that you arrested them or wrote them the ticket? <laughs> I believe that, yes. That is amazing. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yes. It's uh, it's uh, And it can be a hindrance sometimes, huh. without a doubt. Uh, but but I have found that it kind of goes hand in hand. God God puts you in positions, right? And I've told the church this many a times, and uh, more than more than uh, on several different occasions, I'll pull up to a stop sign. I'll say, "God, which way do you want me to go huh. to make a difference in somebody's life?" Right. And uh, and God has led me right right to where somebody was in need. Oh wow! And so it it's really been a blessing. Uh, there is times that it you have to make decisions that are really really hard. I'm sure there are. They really are. But again, it goes back to how you treat people, and just because somebody broke the law or they did something that they shouldn't, don't make that person a bad person. Mm. And a lot of the things that we deal right with right now is drug abuse and alcoholism, and it everything stems from that. Mm. Uh, it just seems like every. It, Drugs is the bottom line in our society of, of most of the crimes that we deal with. And, and that goes back to our, in our area, it's such a small area that I know these folks, right. I see these folks, mm -hmm. and then, then uh, we can target them in ministry also. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have seen God bring folks from, from the very bottom, the IV drug users, and come and totally change their life hmm. to where their life is a totally different thing now. I, I can't help but think that you're uniquely qualified to be in this position. And I, it, so I'm kind of, I almost feel bad about asking you if you're schizophrenic earlier now. Do, do, you, do you really, do you have to turn off the law? I mean, I'm thinking about this from a biblical perspective. Like, right. Because, you know, in, the New, in a New Testament church, we've, you know, the the law is the schoolmaster that brings us to Christ, and it it doesn't. It, but it doesn't save us, right? We're we're all about mercy, to, especially today. Do you have to turn off part of your brain when you go to the different parts of your job, or is Sean the same guy regardless if he's in the pulpit or uh, flipping the sirens on? I'm the same guy. Yeah, I believe that. I'm the same guy, and if you. I know when I, I'm supervisor now and may not get my videos washed as much, but right. supervisors before, they'd hear me if I got a call. I'm praying for the situation, usually out loud, it's on camera, and, and uh, praying for a good outcome or if I'm going to a uh, crash, mm -hmm. then I'm praying for them. Now, there's times that I have to be pretty strong mm -hmm. and boisterous sometimes, and uh, there's been times that after a pursuit and and uh, all my partners are waiting on me to holler out that cuss word. 
Right. You know, and oh, yeah. uh, but they're going to get you. Yeah, they thought they had me one day. <laughs> and I said, sucker. <laughs> I said, get on the ground, sucker. <laughs> so it, uh, it, but no, I, I, I try to do exactly what God has called me to do and do my job the way I'm supposed to do it. Tell me why you think that drugs are at the center or such a, why maybe, maybe I'm asking you to think about why there's such um, a stumbling block for us today. It is so powerful. The drugs are so powerful. You know, and we thought, Methamphetamine a while back, years ago, back in the nineties, was was so bad. And it was. Mm-hmm. It's it's horrible and it still is today. And it totally changes somebody's being. Right. It uh mm-hmm. we used to call it Satan mm. uh, or the devil's drug. Right. And I still believe that. But now we even got uh, uh a fentanyl right. that is even so much more powerful that is destroying uh our our people. And uh, the thing is, you take somebody that wouldn't normally use it, and uh, they use it one time, then one time they can be addicted. And it's not the same person again. Mm -hmm. And it's got such a hold on on people in our society that uh, if we don't get a heart as pastors Mm -hmm. for these people, and and I'm just going to throw this out there, and I was thinking about it earlier, that... uh, as Christians, I believe that uh, that we are getting the devil is still in our time. He is still in our time, and uh, stealing our time. stealing our time yeah. in society today. And uh, we are so busy, such a busy society yeah, yeah. that we are not allowed. We don't have that burden mm-hmm. for the loss like like we need to have. And uh, but I'm telling you right now, as Christians, we got to quit looking like. You know, looking at the overall view of what's going on in our world and thinking, man, there's no hope for it, and start saying this could be the biggest time, the biggest time for revival because there is so many people that are addicted to this and they're at their their wit's end. They have nowhere else to turn, Chris. Mm. So we've got to make sure that the devil don't steal our time and we take time with the heart to get out and reach these people. Man, that's that feels like a a call to action. How, how do you, how do you do that? I I don't. <clears throat> do you volunteer? Do you do you just you get into the not you, but you, put your put your pastor hat on for a moment and talk to your congregation. And I'm asking the question of the pastor: how how does the church solve that problem? How do we get involved? How do we be the hands and feet of Jesus in this situation. We talk about that quite a bit, and we talk about outreach here at our church. We, we, uh, we preach it. We talk about it, and uh, and we talk about the devil still in our time, mm-hmm. and we try to balance that. We really focus on trying to balance that, and uh, it just take if we'll start reaching our community in a way that that it catches other people's eye. It just, I'll give an example. Yesterday, these guys, these firemen, was out fighting fires for, for two days mm. and 106, seven degrees. Yeah, it's hot here. Yeah, it's, it's, it, yeah, you could fry an egg out here. Yep. You, you didn't want to touch the doorknob because it was, I mean, it, it was too hot to handle. Yeah. And there's, you know, you guys I, have had some dry thunder, dry lightning. Yes, storms we did. Where, no rain, you just but but the the lightning is touching off grass fires. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, we had the uh, three days ago we had a dry thunderstorm come through, started multiple fires in the western part of our county, and uh, I talked to the emergency management director uh, yesterday afternoon at about four o'clock and I or three forty five I believe, and I said, is there something? that as a church that we can do to help. Mm. And shortly after that, around four o'clock, he texted and said, hey, we need food for 80 to 90 firemen. Wow. And we sent out a group text to our church folks. And within just by five o'clock, we had 20 or 25, maybe more church folks showed up 
last night made made 150 sandwiches, wow. and sack lunches, and we took it out there. And I just believe, Chris, we don't do that for show. We do that right. because people see that we are serious about mm-hmm. about lives. And and you go, how does that relate to to uh, drug abuse and things? That the word gets out mm-hmm. that there is a church that or a people, not a church. There's great churches all over this community. Mm-hmm. But we've got to be different than everybody else. We, as Christians, we have got to be different. Right. And when we fall in love with God and people look at our life and they see that we're doing things for other people, they want to be part of it because too many times the churches give in to the things of this world. Mm-hmm. And people that are lost, they're wanting a difference. Right. They're wanting to make a change. They don't want the same same, same. They want something different. And so if you can reach them by any mechanism of fundraisers, uh, re- going to your little parts of your community and doing things, we just gave a uh, hundred kids uh, shoe cards back to school, $50 each. and uh, for t- for So that they could have shoes. So that they would have shoes in our community. And uh, and again, brother, I'm telling you, and I don't want it to ever sound like like it's bragging or anything like that. But when, as a pastor, as a church, when you start doing those type of things, mm-hmm. you're reaching kids in those households. Right. And those kids may be the reason that their mom and dads yep. see that there's hope. Yep. And And those mom and dads are the ones that are hooked on drugs. Right. And when they see this then we're having them come to church, and it's just making a difference in lives. A uh, pastor in Waco, Texas, it's Cowboy Church, and uh, his slogan was, if you catch, how did he say it? If you catch the, um, if you catch the calf, you get the heifer. Right. That's right. <laughs> And that's kind of what you're saying. Isn't that's that's exactly right. Yeah, and it's 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 been a blessing to us, mm-hmm. brother, just to see what God's done. 